gentlemen, let's continue our session and in, in this session we will have two invited speakers. Uh, and first of them is Jose Carrasco from the Spain, uh, from MSIS. Please, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for your invitation for this opportunity <coughs> to, have to give this uh, speech at this uh, electronics conference. My name is Jose Carrasco. I come from a small company in Spain. And our main activity is to design and manufacture uh, electronics for space systems. We are, we are a company quite small, we are only 10 people, uh, but we have a, a laboratory equipped with different instrumentation to make the uh, design of uh, equipment that has flown already and that will be fly in the future. We have uh, a small clean room, several contacts with the European Space Agency we have had, and some other contacts with uh, other companies. Uh, we have developed as well a platform, a small platform, a QSAT, CubeSat type platform for doing experiments in space that, that we uh, offer as a closed product so that uh, any uh, scient scientist that, may that wants to realize an experiment in space doesn't have to worry about the how everything works and how it has to be launched. Uh, has to uh, prepare only its, uh, his experiment or her experiment, put in the platform, and we, we can fly it uh, for him or for her. So uh, we have one mission plan, uh, plan already. And uh, as we have this small platform, we were selected for an European Space Agency project to participate in a mission to an asteroid. We, so this is what I, what I am going to describe in this conference. The outline of this conference is the to outline the differences between a platform and, or a small platform that is orbiting around Earth and one that goes beyond the orbit of the Earth. Then I will describe as an example a deep space scenario that we participated in and I will describe a proposed small platform that may go outside Earth, Earth orbit. And then the topology of the platform, uh, the topology of the platform for the mission, in particular how the electronics has been tailored for fulfilling this, in this mission. So the proposed, the proposed, or whatever, the scenario that I'm going to describe is a mission uh, that is planning, that has been planned by NASA and the European Space Agency. To visit, to visit an asteroid and to try to divert the orbit of it by impacting a probe that will, that will travel from Earth di directly to impact on the asteroid. This is part of the NASA, of the NASA mission. NASA will launch a probe that will travel on its own to impact on the asteroid. And uh, on its own, ESA will launch a probe that will be orbiting the asteroid where the impactor comes and uh, crashes on the asteroid. As part of the mission, so this is the <coughs> this is the impactor and this is ISA's prop. The name of the asteroid is Didymos. I will describe it later. It's a binary, it's a binary asteroid. And uh, as part of the mission of the ISA mission, the probe from ESA will have two CubeSat and a, and a lander as well. So one, uh, when the ESA spacecraft reaches the orbit of the asteroid, it will be keep it will keep orbiting, and it will release one one lander that will land on the on the asteroid and two CubeSats that one of them will orbit around and the other one will orbit on the will, will actually uh, orbit the asteroid. So this is a image of the. ESA probe orbiting the asteroid. The asteroid is double, as I mentioned, the two CubeSats, and the expected scenario when the impactor comes and impacts on the asteroid. So what we want to do 
when, when, it's a, when we arrive into the asteroid is to study the basic, the basic properties of the, the asteroid. And the basic properties are what's the, gr the gravity of the body, what is, does it have a magnetic field or not, and what are the properties of the soil. Is, is it solid or, it's, or how it's covered, how is the regolith that covers the, the, the asteroid. Does it have a solid surface or will the landers that go to the asteroid just bury deep inside the asteroid because the, the surface is not solid. So this is the, the part of the science that uh, the ESA probe is going to do, the lander and the CubeSat. And of course, <coughs> there are many players in the, in the mission. Mm -hmm. From the point of view of the industries involved, our eye is uh, kept in the possibilities of getting information for future mining, a uh, space mining of asteroids. This is what we have in mind as a company. But this is what we know, practically what we know about the asteroid is uh, just a few things, just guess estimations on how it behaves. This is the only image that we have, which is, which is gotten using a radar from the Earth. And what we imagine <coughs> is that the asteroid, that the, the asteroid has this shape, it's a, a little bit elongating on, on its equator. This is the equator. It's binary. It has a moon uh, orbiting around. <coughs> and the plan is to, to actually land on the moon and on, on the real asteroid. Because if the assumptions are correct, the gravity of the asteroid is very, very, very low. The escape speed is just six centimeters per second. So if you have a very, very small speed, you will not, it's very difficult to land on it. And even the, it is supposed that over the equator of the main body, the escape velocity is equal to the velocity of, the, of its rotation. So in fact, any stone or any uh, dust sitting on the equator is actually escaping out of the asteroid. So, so it's, it's very difficult to, to run on it if, if uh, any possibility to run on the main asteroid should be in the poles. And so this is uh, this is avoided, and the mission will land on the on the on the actual moon of the asteroid. So we're going to the. So even if we well, our plan, the plan for our platform is to land on the asteroid just to be released. It's a very small cu uh, satellite, CubeSat type, CubeSat type. It doesn't have any propulsion, nothing. So if we are just released and trust on the gravity of the asteroid, there is some possibilities that we actually end up landing there. Although there are the, the possibilities are not 100%, because even being released at, at a very, very small speed, the CubeSat, the releases CubeSat, will have some, will impact on the surface, will rebound, sorry, will rebound several times, and there is some possibilities that we, after rebounding up to 34 times, there is some possibilities that it will actually be on the surface, or there are some even some possibilities that it will go up, it, it will go out of the orbit of the asteroid. So if we end up in the surface, we'll have to cope with the extreme environment that is around the uh, the asteroid. The from the thermal point of view, and this is a thermal a thermal model of the asteroid, just a model of what we suppose is to be the thermal, uh, thermal environment around the asteroid. If you think of the Earth, the Earth is uh, actually a very balmy environment around. The Earth uh, keeps heating up the bodies orbiting it, even when they are under eclipse, because the Earth radiation, even uh, on the dark side, is very, very high. So it's very easy for a satellite to keep its, to keep its uh, temperature more or less constant with when orbiting the Earth. But for a body that is outside, what for, for a small body that is uh, at one or one point something uh, astronomical units <coughs> of the Sun, and for this particular, and this is true for any deep space experiment, the temperature, this is a model of the temperature when uh, a a satellite orbiting the asteroid is being under sun illumination. Its temperature may go up, uh, up to 320 Kelvin, so plus 40 degrees or something like that. 
and if it goes under the asteroid, if it's under dark, the temperature may go down to less than 200 K, so minus uh, 80 degrees or even less than that. So it's not that easy to keep temp the D electronics working under that extreme environment. And even if you, if you follow, try to follow the strategy that is uh, followed uh, within the ESAN uh, orbit, which is just painting the satellite with uh, coating where you can control the any signals of the satellite. If you, oh, sorry, if you paint it with uh, black paint, for instance, you may get a very good temperature, 11 degrees when under the sun, the sun but minus 130 degrees under eclipse. And if you paint it with alumina captain that has very low emissivity, when you are under the under eclipse, it's minus 34 degrees, which is okay for the electronics. But when you get in sunlight, you go up to 100 degrees centigrade. So this is not quite good for the electronics point of view. <coughs> Even well, for the electronics, normal electronics that you know it works from storage mi minus 65 to 105 to 50. Working normal work nominal temperature is uh, minus 42 plus uh, 85. If, of course, it's possible to get the, the electronics go working outside these limits, even for, for very low temperatures, it's possible to qualify normal electronics for going down cryogenic, cryogenic temperature minus 200, minus 200 and something degrees, because you have to, 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 to provide special mounting techniques to avoid the, to avoid the stress that the electronics suffer when going in a thermal cycle, this is normal way of mounting the components when they are going to work in a very extreme environment to, to have a, a stress relief in the leads of the of the PCBs, for instance. And it's not seen very well, but I have a picture here on how a DC DC converter, a power converter, may be qualified in a case by case basis. A normal DC DC converter that works within this temperature range may be qualified down to, to 200 degrees Kelvin to minus 100 degrees uh, below zero because in fact the MOSFET transistors work better, work better at low temperatures but the, the real effect of all the components may be uh, beneficial for any range of powers and may be very bad for another range. So it could be done, but uh, in our approach, we haven't followed that approach. And what we have decided to make the electronics work in these extreme temperatures is to cover, this is the, the, the exterior part of the satellite, the inner part of the satellite, and in the middle we have put a layer, of a multi-layer insulation that keeps a very good insulation between the outside and the inside and has a very low thermal conductivity between the, in the inside and the outside. Uh, of course, this multilayer insulation, if we have something, if we, ha if we have something releasing power in here, the temperature inside can, be, can go very high. Mm. And, uh, and that's why we have a thermal switch that connects the internal part and the, and the external part of the structure. So if the exterior is uh, at low temperature and the interior is high temperature, we may connect both sides and evaporate heat. And if the interior is at low temperature and the exterior is at, at a high temperature, we may connect as well the inner and outer side and, and get heat inside the satellite. So we have a temperature regulation with this thermal switch. And we have a layer insulation, a multi-layer insulation to try to keep the electronics between minus 40 and plus 85 degrees centigrade. Of course, we have, a, we have to make sure that this structure, uh, from the point of view of a launch, will withstand. And that means to have AM frequencies as, as high as, high as, as possible, and to ensure a, a launch uh, having AM frequencies are bigger than 200 hertz, that's warranty, when the satellite is supported so on the edges, on the edges or on the sides. So we may, with this structure, we, we need some simulation to warranty that. And for the thermal point of view, 
we've made some simulations of the satellite as well to see what's the temperature inside and what's the temperature outside when the CubeSat is deployed and when it's resting on the surface of the asteroid. And as you may see, when uh, this have to thermal, the, the working of the thermal control of the, of the satellite, this is the actual temperature outside the blue line and this is the temperature of the satellite when, uh, of the interior of the satellite with two loads working. If we have too much load in, in the interior of the satellite, the temperature inside goes up. And if we have no load, the, or a very small load, very small power being consumed inside the satellite, the temperature is, is kept low. And uh, this is why descending, this is why on the surface, and this is in the surface with no load. This is in the surface with, with no power consumed inside. And uh, what we have seen is if the thermal switch is kept on, we, we have this kind of, of uh, power profile. If we play with the thermal switch, and when the exterior is, uh, is warm, we switch on the thermal switch, we heat up the interior <coughs> of the satellite. And when the internal par part, when the, when the exterior is at low temperature, <coughs> we switch off the thermal switch, we don't get the, te the internal temperature going, going down. We may uh, regulate the temperature inside the satellite to be, to be kept uh, be at bigger than minus 40 degrees at lower temperatures than plus 85. This is the electrical block, block, block diagram of the platform as well. As we have seen before, uh, we have the <coughs> the faces of the satellite do not have the same number of solar cells in each of them because we have to, we need to have communications antenna with the main platform to relay the data that we get and therefore <coughs> we have an uh, asymmetrical solar panels and for that we have a design a power system that extracts the maximum power of each phase of the satellite and not of the combination of what is happening at, at each side. So we get, uh, even if the solar panels are different, even if they are unevenly illuminated, we may get the maximum power of each of the phases of the satellite. Then we have some protection of each line to avoid the batteries being discharged under the uh, solar panels that is, not, that is not under illumination. And uh, we rely on two batteries, one primary battery and a secondary battery. The secondary battery will be recharged by the solar panels. And the, pri and the primary battery is not recharged, it's not rechargeable. And this is because if we land in a dark area, we at least rely on a primary battery that guarantees a minimum science for emission. And if we end up landing in an illuminated area, we put a secondary battery that may be charged and discharged uh, using the money charged using the solar rays and will be discharged to the payloads uh, through a power distribution unit. We have power distribution unit fully protected with over voltage and over current and uh, with protection or uh, if there is a there is a low latch due to the passage of a, of an alpha particle something will happen what is called a single event upset or a single event match. Uh, we may react open that, open, uh, up on that and uh, open the load and, uh, and uh, reset a load, that is, a load that is malfunctioning. Payloads are here with the science. We bought uh, the, the radio of the, of the antennas and a heater that helps the thermal switch to keep the temperature of the inside of the, of the satellite regulator. This is a, a view of the solar ray regulators, which are quite small. In fact, we bought here eight solar ray regulators in one the, the footprint of a, of a CubeSat. For this mission, we only need four, but it's uh, just a picture to show you that they are, even if they have maximum power point tracking of the solar rays, uh, the electronic is quite small. And this is why we are not using any kind of uh, power or microprocessor or anything like that to calculate the maximum power point. Maximum power point is calculated using a very, very simple technique 
which, co which consists on multiplying the current and the voltage across the solar array using the same uh, power width modulation technique that is being used in that uh, regulate the uh, output current from the solar array and charging the battery. If we make a multiplication using a PW multiplier of the current voltage, we soon realize that this is not the power, this is not uh, the real power going out of the power of the solar array, but this PWM multiplication uh, has the same maximum power point as the maximum power point of the solar array. And then using this very simple thing, it is possible to get the maximum power from the solar array. This is what we work. And for instance, for this, for this many mission, this is, for this very big mission, this is the power profile of the mission, the, the power being extracted from the batteries. We consider this, the satellite is always under emission. And the, the actual charge of the battery that is going down and up and is being recharged after an eclipse period. So we, we may end up working in this mode uh, for practically forever. And this is the working of the heater that in combination with the temperature inside the satellite. Of course, we are providing some, just some examples, some protections for the, for single level and single level upsets of the payload going outside. Everything is uh, protected and redundant. As I mean, as an example, I've got here the, pro the redundancy implemented in a very simple uh, linear power supply. This is a linear power supply that is composed by the, by, uh, the transistor regulator whose uh, output voltage is being regulated by a signal. But as we want anything in here to fail and the power supply continue working, everything is uh, duplicated, the uh, regulating transistor duplicated, the signals will be uh, duplicated, we have some protections to our diodes, and if something here fails, we put another one duplicated as well to provide power to, to provide power to the system. And of course, one of the things that we have here as well is that we only have one power, the, 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 the battery cells are only providing us 3.5 volts, so that's very, very uh, small uh, voltage. And if we want to regulate, and if we, if we want to get five volts, for instance, for instance, out of the uh, of the of 3.5 volts, we, we may put a boost regulator. But as the voltages are so low, and we have to use uh, radiation hardened uh, uh, electronics, there are not in the market uh, any such components to work under the radiation environments with such a with such a small uh, voltage explosion to work to work with. And that's why, for instance, the air amplifier of uh, the boost regulator is implemented using uh, uh, discrete components just to, to, to be able to withstand the radiation environment uh, within the satellite. I've got another example of a power supply. Power supply is to, be to, extract, to extract more uh, several 10 volts from the battery may be implemented using a very simple uh, resonance of the silicon power supply implemented by a person working in the European Space Agency and with uh, this is a, a converter that whose uh, uh, primary waveforms are resonating and with a very simple topology we have we may, uh, we may increase the voltage given by the batteries with 99% efficiency. We need an umbilical connector as well, although this is not included in the CubeSat standard. We, we are using a commercial connector. The, before the deployment of the CubeSat, we need to get some data of what is happening, or what is going to happen, and of course we need to recharge the secondary battery uh, because it will be discharged during the journey to the, to the asteroid. And uh, this is a connector that we are using. This is uh, the connection between the main spacecraft and the CubeSat, which is a very usual circuitry. Again, duplicated. This is only one line of the RS485 uh, line, which as well, any component in here may fail, and the line continues working. Sometimes, if one of the components fails, uh, the line continues working. And uh, sometimes, one of the lines, if, if one of, of if a component here, fails and, the, and this line fails, we have a real line to continue the operation of the, the, the communication of the satellite. 
and uh, and this is the radio link between the satellite and the, the main spacecraft, which is a prototype of an engineering model of the, of the radio link. And uh, as well as before, in a CubeSat footprint, we have a, a radio working at 5.8 gigahertz with uh, two robots and convolutional codes for data encoding and for communications. And this is a general view of the mission that we've been preparing for ESA for going to the to an asteroid. That's an example of the electronic world in uh, in a small platform as well. Thank you very much for uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you want to ask questions, we have some questions, yes. I'm really curious how you stabilize the satellite because if it is on Earth orbit, that's magnetic field that yeah. can be used. But here you don't have the magnetic. Field. Yeah, and in fact, we don't have nothing. We don't expect to have magnetic field, and it, and it is not stabilized. The main goal was to do the platform as simple as possible, and simplest thing is having no stabilization, no no attitude control. So the CubeSat is released. At, at much less than six centimeters per second, mm -hmm. because if it's released at six per centimeters per second, we, we will not land in the satellite, and it just goes down tumbling, and and it lands. Of course, when releasing, you have to ensure that it doesn't go uh, uh, outside tumbling, because mm -hmm. if when it touches the surface, the tumbling uh, translate into kinetic energy, it will not stop. The, the rebound and it will go out of the asteroid as well. So it has to get out of the main spacecraft very gently, very smoothly, and with very small uh, speed to actually land in the satellite. But there are, there are in fact, there are no qualified attitude control systems for CubeSats uh, out of the Earth environment. So. More questions? I'm wondering uh, when uh, you will collect the data or you store it somewhere locally in this satellite and yeah. transmit them. Uh, yeah. Where is the data will be stored? Sure. Where? Where the data? Well, the, there is a local storage. Because local storage. So memories? Yeah, memory. Uh, flash memory. Flash. There is flash memory qualified for space uh, applications. Uh -huh. But you have to provide it with uh, single level latch up uh, protections. Mm -hmm. So if some particle goes through, sometimes the memory consumes all mm -hmm. the power, and there is a current, uh, a current uh, <coughs> sensor that measures the current being actually consumed by the memory, and if the, if the current consumption goes high, <coughs> you switch off everything, reset the memory, and put it into working again. So the flash, flash uh, memories have been used in space. So we, we store the, lo the data locally, and then we have some communication windows with the main spacecraft. And then that's that's all planned. <coughs> so, no more questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, <coughs> how, uh, how long it's uh, designed to operate uh, in space? Yeah, the once we have released, it's three months operation. So we don't have to worry very much about uh, total dose dose uh, radiation, but we have to worry about the particles, the radiation going through. <coughs> There are no many questions. No more questions. Thank you. And a special gift for our presenter. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have questions. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude for uh, invitation to uh, deliver speech in this uh, conference of distinguished uh, uh, community of uh, scientists in field of electronics. Um, actually, 
personally me i have the only one touch to electronics when i touch my cell phone uh, my education is i'm a lawyer at the moment i work at the division of uh, strategic analysis uh, and research at nato energy security center of excellence but since we have uh, interest in uh, energy security which is directly connected to energy efficiency uh, i hope that uh, i will contribute with uh, uh, some ideas or uh, aspects which will initiate uh, your uh, activities in future to work uh, for particular uh, uh, end users. So, uh, actually, I am representing really the consumer part of, of the society uh, for which you are working. And I would like to present uh, a little bit different approach than it was presented uh, before uh, my speech. Uh, I will talk on energy efficiency and uh, what, what is important uh, uh, for armed forces at the moment. Uh, the f uh, some some main points in, in my speech, I will present in short uh, NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence, what kind of institution is uh, the center, why NATO cares about uh, energy security and, and, and in particular energy efficiency. Then I will present uh, our view to energy efficiency and finally we'll present uh, some practical uh, examples how do we go towards uh, energy efficiency and how your community could contribute to uh, those efforts. So uh, our center, our center is quite young one. Uh, uh, it was established in uh, year 2012. Uh, initially there were just uh, six countries, uh, Lithuania's framework uh, nation and, and the center is, is, is located in, in Lithuania at the moment. Uh, other countries, Estonia, Italy, France, Latvia, Turkey, as sponsoring nations. What is impro important for us, uh, we are granted the status of international military organization, our center in particular, and activated by North Atlantic Council in year 2012, uh, then uh, inaugurated uh, by uh, Secretary General uh, of NATO in year two 2013, and so on and so on. What is, uh, let's say, more relevant to, to this topic? We are not uh, just young, we are uh, quite small uh, at our center we have uh, 10 expert and well 12 including a director and de deputy director who who are representing the center as the, the highest level uh, representatives uh, what is the NATO role in in, in energy uh, security uh, in year 2000, 2014, uh, the Wales Summit Declaration identified three main areas uh, in which we work as uh, uh, institution having expertise. Uh, the first one raised awareness on energy development within security implication. Um, I will not go in details. Uh, with this, the second one is more relevant to the topic enhance energy efficiency in the military and uh, uh, with some contribution to environmental protection which is at the moment very popular contribute to develop uh, uh, knowledge uh, to support protection of uh, critical energy infrastructure. 
So the second one is uh, more important. Now, uh, just few points to uh, to underline. First of all, NATO isn't uh, mm. energy agency. That's why NATO doesn't work directly in energy efficiency related issues like uh, critical energy infrastructure protection. We just contribute by, by knowledge, sharing knowledge, educating uh, uh, entities, uh, contributing to exercises and so on and so on. Uh, in terms of uh, enhancing energy efficiency, uh, we have uh, a little bit more space and uh, you know, there is a science and technology organization within NATO, perhaps you already have heard about this. Uh, this organization is uh, an entity which uh, can contribute to funding of uh, scientific, uh, scientific uh, researches uh, which contribute to uh, military needs and uh, why NATO should care about uh, energy efficiency we have at least uh, three main groups of arguments uh, the the first one strategic level it's not so much relevant to, to the topic of this conference and it's uh, much more global, like increasing role of energy in international relations with implied security implication. Uh, would you like an example? Uh, let's say uh, Lithuania knows for sure uh, Druzhba pipeline uh, issues when oil supply was cut to Lithuania and we, have, uh, we had a uh, huge impact at that moment. Uh, next example, uh, prices for gas. Uh, again, uh, for some period, Lithuania was paying uh, up to 30% higher uh, price for the natural gas than uh, other European uh, countries. So, NATO doesn't uh, order the particular nation how to, uh, how to act or how to behave but NATO can support uh, uh, for instance uh, 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 support the country by uh, sharing knowledge uh, uh, implementing some uh, policies together uh, with with particular country and so on and so on uh, what is more relevant to, uh, to our topic is uh, operational and tactical level and here we can uh, we can feel how the, the practice is uh, performing. Uh, first of all uh, we must realize that about 60-80% uh, uh, of resupply volume is fuel and water and it limits uh, sustainment uh, alternatives. So fuel supply to, to operations and we can we can find uh, very uh, complicated examples. For instance about 60-65% uh, of uh, energy supply goes uh, via uh, uh, marine routes marine routes which have uh, so-called choke points uh, like straits, uh, uh, Strait of Hormuz next to Iran. So NATO is uh, attempting to protect uh, free flow of goods uh, on one hand in, 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 in those critical areas, on the other hand in areas where direct illegal uh, activities are going on like uh, next to uh, Somalia when piracy increased uh, uh, seven six years uh, ago to uh, tremendous level so NATO contributed to protect uh, shipment in this area uh, cost of fuel it ranges from four dollar uh, four dollars uh, for gallon uh, to as high as 56 gallon 
uh, uh, $56 uh, per gallon uh, in operations in Afghanistan. You might ask, uh, how can it happen? Doesn't market work in this area? No, because in, in some areas uh, during operation, the, the fuel must, del must be delivered by helicopter and it, it's co it costs a lot. Uh, what is more important in, in this level, and uh, when we think that, well, uh, techniques work and, and, and everything is okay, good. But when we come to a particular uh, personal level, on average, one soldier died uh, in every 24th fuel convoy in the US military in Afghanistan. <coughs> Uh, during uh, Iraq and Afghanistan conflict, about 3,000 uh, 3, uh, troops uh, died or were s seriously injured just during convoying fuel. So it means that energy which is needed for an energy, I'm talking not only about fuel, but uh, fuel is converted to other uh, kinds of energy like electricity. Electricity is es essential in desert where, where is uh, plus 46, 50 degrees Celsius. It's very difficult to survive for, for human beings. So uh, cooling systems are running 24-7 and generators are running 24-7. So uh, those systems require a lot of fuel. Tactical uh, level, uh, what we can identify, just interesting uh, aspect. Uh, in World War II, which was just uh, 70 years ago, 65 years ago, one gallon per, per soldier per day was used. Today, uh, military armed forces, they need at least 20 gallons per soldier per day. So uh, amount of energy required uh, by, uh, by equipment techniques uh, uh, has increased. That's why NATO cares about energy, energy resources and uh, energy efficiency. I will skip one, one part of presentation. I, I had a small cartoon movie, but uh, I will just mention some some aspects a little bit later one of them well uh, just an example uh, well maybe I will go it I, I will come to it uh, a little bit later back well uh, energy efficiency uh, what is what is important to realize that Energy efficiency can be reached uh, can be reached uh, uh, via different means. Uh, some of uh, some of uh, tools how to do this are technological ones, and and this is your part of interest. Another part is uh, so-called non-material or cultural uh, aspects. Uh, which are very important. Uh, I can give you another example from operation in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, some scientists uh, working in quite different area, but they were next to uh, deployed uh, armed forces in Afghanistan. What they noticed that some soldiers during the night, they went outside of the tent and were sleeping outside of the tent. Uh, later they found out that uh, someone, I think some senior officer, was in charge to set the cooling system and he left the, the, uh, the tent and cooling system was uh, running so long and so intensive that inside of the tent it was plus 12 of, uh, outside of the tent, it was 35. Uh, so, plus 12, it was worse for soldiers, so they left the tent and were sleeping outside. What does it mean? Actually, it means that 
management energy energy management is one of uh, uh, one of issues uh, which should be solved uh, in NATO forces what is important uh, maybe not so much for you but for us it is indeed uh, energy efficiency can be considered as the capability to use the minimum required energy providing the same military uh, capacities and a little bit later I will underline this the same military capacities it's crucial we work not for the sake of saving dollar we work for the sake of reaching the final task of operation in other words we work for the sake of soldier uh, that he or she could come home after the operation so increasing uh, capability uh, at the same time using less uh, energy this is uh, our task uh, what is important uh, yeah. uh, to achieve energy efficiency we were working together with the military engineering uh, uh, center of excellence <coughs> by the way I didn't mention and uh, in NATO community there are 24 uh, centers uh, of excellence and each center works in specific area of knowledge our area is energy, efficient, energy security uh, uh, there is military engineering uh, COE uh, there are for instance uh, in Norway there is uh, cold weather operations uh, center of excellence and so on and so on and those centers are not under the chain of command of NATO what, which is very important to underline and later I will uh, come to this so energy efficiency uh, to achieve uh, energy efficiency there are three key principles should be taken into account modularity interoperability and sustainability uh, frankly speaking it's very difficult at the moment to deal with a lot of uh, management and marketing issues uh, within mil military uh, why the idea is inter interoperability is the task uh, achieving which we could connect devices of any country any armed forces together uh, I can give you an example during operation uh, uh, British soldiers and and uh, uh, soldiers of uh, United States of America are uh, deployed in in the same area uh, whatever reasons uh, break the generator of British armed forces British armed forces they have the whole network which supplies the camp but they don't have generator but the Americans do so the main issue is interoperability ability to connect these grids to make them uh, uh, work together and this is the real issue why because in in civil life uh, marketing and competition uh, brings to, to task make a little bit different unique gadget so this gadget could be managed just by 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 one uh, uh, provider or, or, or uh, uh, supplier in this uh, in this regard in, in military uh, we have to go towards interoperability where uh, Dutch soldiers could connect their cable to uh, to the generator of, of, of Great Britain soldiers and so on and so on uh, so inter 
interconnectivity is one of uh, of main issues, and and this is, I think, one of part of 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 uh, task of industry. Uh, another aspect uh, which was today already mentioned in in part. Uh, I would like to underline this number. Uh, for fully equipped uh, soldier, uh, which goes to operation for 72 hours, he or she must carry uh, about 8 kilos of different kinds of batteries. Uh, and it's difficult. Why? Because after three days, he or she must be resupplied somehow in operation far away in, 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 in dangerous environment. And can you imagine a platoon, dismounted platoon, uh, brings uh, 200 kilos of, of uh, used batteries. Uh, so what is important for militaries uh, now the technology allows to to recharge batteries without uh, direct connection, right? The soldier just sits into hammer and and all equipment is charging. The main question is whether British soldier will be recharged in German hammer or boxer or other vehicle. So again, interoperability is the the key issue. Uh, since we have not so much time, I will present in, in, in short one of our projects which was developed during the last two years. Uh, in civil uh, life, it's not uh, any, it's no discovery or something like that. It's normal normal uh, daily daily technology but in in military it is something different uh, our center launched uh, the procurement uh, of hybrid smart power generation system uh, and and it was equipped with uh, power management system at the same time uh, the, the system consists of uh, two, uh, two containers, uh, C, standard uh, C containers, uh, in which all solar, panel, solar panels uh, can be fitted. Uh, there are two wind uh, turbines and two uh, conventional diesel generators. And this system is equipped with uh, uh, batteries, 100 uh, kilowatt hour storage and management system. And uh, uh, this is just nice show, user friendly interface. And what is more important is this, uh, the generator is already uh, given to Lithuanian Armed Forces and we are working on uh, on schedule of, of uh, uh, text testing and experimentation but uh, estimate uh, workload should be a look like uh, should look like this uh, what is here here we have uh, the grayscale uh, the time of uh, working of, of the generator. Uh, the red line is uh, the energy requirement or uh, usage of energy and the uh, time scale. So in the morning, uh, prior to breakfast, generator loads the, the battery, which is in, in green. And what is most important? First of all, uh, with this system, we had uh, one day 
test running, uh, uh, we noticed that fuel saving is uh, about 25-30% fuel saving. What is very important, uh, the uh, generator uh, runtime. What does it mean? Uh, perhaps uh, most of you, or at least some of you, uh, had uh, holidays in, in camps resting in tents. And maybe some of, on, of you had uh, uh, pretty nasty neighbors who were celebrating birthday or whatever, so you can imagine the noise. Can you imagine the noise of generator which is standing just five meters away, uh, away from, from your tent and running 24-7? Uh, trust me, yeah, soldiers, they are tough guys, but it's, it's real un annoying and exhausting. So the, the system uh, and which allows generator run three times per day and uh, can supply 100 uh, 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 soldiers, this particular system, it's something different. By the way, the system is going to be tested in any environmental uh, conditions. It's, it's very important for military. It's deployable. It can, de and it can be deployed or uh, 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 constructed within four hours, so it's not so, so long time. Uh, some data on fuel saving, but since I, I'm running out of, uh, out of time, some final, uh, final sentences. First of all, energy uh, efficiency, energy in transition is capability enabler, enabler. It reduces energy dependence, reduces logistic pr footprint, uh, you remember and those uh, 3,000 soldiers uh, which were convoying the, the fuel reduces risk, costs, and uh, this is not very politically correct, but reduce carbon foot footprint. Believe me, for soldiers, the main uh, task is uh, successful operation and uh, uh, way back uh, home, not the, the environment, because if we start calculate uh, what damage for, for the environment uh, uh, create bombs, rockets and so on, so the, the fuel isn't the main, the main issue. Uh, summing up, this year in Vilnius uh, we organize uh, conference and exhibition, it's called Innovative Energy Solutions for Military Applications. And we try to connect military, industry and academia to call those three uh, entities or uh, areas uh, to collect in, 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 in one, pla one place, uh, have discussions and find uh, solutions for uh, uh, for for uh, innovative uh, uh, and efficient uh, energy usage. So if you will have uh, any questions, you can address to me during lunch. After lunch, I, I will have to leave, so I'm, I'm sorry very much. But be sure that this is the best way to implement all your excellent work which you do as scientists. Why? Because here science meets uh, the, the, the practice. So uh, finalizing with this, uh, here this is the real practical application of your knowledge which is required by, by the way, most of uh, funds which uh, provide financing for for uh, scientific uh, projects. So, thank you very much for your uh, attention. If you have any questions, thank you.
No question. <coughs> So. Absolutely clear. <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Thank you very much.